2020 Michigan <coughs> 2020 Michigan Emmy Award. You are welcome here featuring Salina School. All right, sorry, I'm gonna go after. I'm gonna ask Miss Stanley to come up um, and Miss Ahmed. And this is this was we re we mentioned this before at a board meeting. Um, about the Salina uh, Color in Colorado, but we did not recognize for the Emmy that oh. the publisher uh, came up with, so we're happy to have <laughs> them uh, here, and we're going to let you, uh, Ms. Stanley, mention about the award. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Malaiko and distinguished board members. Thank you. So um, people representing us, you know, Ms. Ahmed and our wonderful parent liaison, um, Ms. Sana Hamadi. You know, when Dr. Malaiko just mentioned um, a few minutes ago saying that we have, the best we have the best teachers and the best staff in the state and the nation. Well, we also talk about evidence. We have the evidence in that Coloring Colorado video that was shown and then won an Emmy Award. Um, if I could just refresh your memory just for a minute about uh, over a couple of years ago, Coloring Colorado, who is a national um, website for EL teachers and for parents, reached out to Dr. Maleko and to Rose Aldo Bailey and um, to Chris Shefferly because they had heard about all the great things that were going on in Dearborn Public Schools. They heard about it through NABE and through MABE, national organizations. So out of that then came various interviews with district leadership about all the great things that are going on. They learned about the collaboration um, that starts at the district level with the superintendent the Board of Education and all the way down. And so how we are supported to be able to do our job so teachers can do theirs, which is provide a great environment for students so they feel safe to learn. So we are really proud to just represent all of the teachers and all of the staff in Dearborn. And it's just such an honor for this voice to be heard and for this story to get out. As a matter of fact, out of that interview and how the interview started and it all trickled down, um, we are now in books that talk about our EL program here. There's another article that is going to be published about all the great things that are going on in Dearborn. So many thanks to all of you. Yeah. So Oh, it really is an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, please. Commendations. Good evening, board members. Um, Couple of things. The students came back, dropped off five signs. So I'll let you guys wrestle over them later on. <laughs> uh, Mary, I know you already have got, yours. So one. trust punch off. You have yours. So the six of you might have to go at it. Um, but I'll let you guys figure that one out. And uh, secondly, uh, Trustee Barry, um, you know, you always need help in our office. Now that you have the degree, you know, I can come on in and you know help out with communication efforts. I'd be more than happy to. Have have you part of the team. Thank you, thank you. Too kind. <laughs> I joke. I joke. Of course. Uh, district commendations. Commendations to uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Salah. He's a graduate of the Dearborn Public Schools and he is now attending, he is an attending physician at Providence Park in Novi and has been taking excellent care of COVID patients, including one of our own staff members. Uh, she was so impressed with his work that she sent us a, a, a note, and she wrote that uh, just praising Dr. Sala uh, for his care and for his work coordinating uh, for her between different providers and helping her understand the roles of each person involved in her care. And she just passed that along, and I just thought it was always nice to share a, a good story uh, about uh, one of the many, many outstanding graduates uh, of the Dearborn Public School. Commendations to the Special Education Department and our Department Executive Director, Mr. Mike Saley, for their recent successful Wayne Risa Medicaid office audits. The audit results specifically praised Yvonne Ravenscroft, uh, Sarah Weebly, 
Tamara Branks, Carolyn Burnett, and Samar uh, Bajori for their uh, careful and accurate record keeping. Commendations to Susan Briggs and all of the Dearborn Public School art teachers and their creative students. Uh, April is Arts Month, month in Dearborn, and the teachers created a video featuring student artwork. The video was posted on school blogs and social media around the district. If any of you have had the opportunity, it is on the Dearborn Public Schools YouTube page. You can find it there. We also uh, cross-promoted it on our social media. Um, they did an outstanding job, and then um, they turned over the presentation to our staff, and our video guys, Eric and Jacob, took it and kind of edited it into a single presentation that you can just watch. Um, the, the, and the artwork from the students is just phenomenal. Also, thanks to the art teachers uh, and some students over at McCulley Eunice who created some nurse appreciation posters that are going to be on display uh, at some of the vaccination clinics and testing clinics that the nurses uh, throughout the county are working at. And so our students were able to take part in that, and our art teachers were able to coordinate that. So thank you to them. Commendations to the following Dearborn High instrumental music students who participated in the MSBO Solo and Ensemble Festival. Students recorded performances and submitted them in February. Each student earned a superior first division rating on their solo performance with piano accompaniment. These students came in over midwinter break to practice and record their performance with the pianist. Um, these, those earning a first division rating included uh, Kadan, Kaden Monterth uh, on trombone, Danielle Harajli on violin, Katie Bogowski, Katie Pagowski on violin, Natalie Jakubowicz on violin, Kaylin Lavasser on violin, and Glenn Warren on flute. Commendations to Fortson High School Principal Kiyama Kadre uh, for her appointment to the Board of Directors for the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. Ms. Kadre will serve as an at-large board member. We have a few more here. Commendations to Etzel Ford athletes who are recognized as all-conference athletes for winter sports. In the swimming all-conference was Abdul al uh, Joshua Constantino, Brent Ryle, and uh, Julian Kane. Boys basketball, uh, Kevion Irby. For girls basketball, Keegan Gerlach <coughs> and uh, Sophia Pal Palmera. Competitive cheer, Kennedy Weekly. And in ice hockey, Stephen Rios, Adam Ahmed, and Wayne Tyman. In boys bowling, Adnan Newman and Logan Sosnowski. In girls bowling, it was Shelby Opalka. Opalka. And in wrestling, it was Joey uh, Marano. And Adso Ford, speaking of Joey Marano, he finished fourth in the Division I wrestling state meet, earning all state honors. And Adso Ford uh, wrestler Sammy. Amahagi qualified for the state meet as well. Etzel swimmer Julian Kane qualified for the Division II swimming state meet and finished 21st in the 100 breaststroke. Accommodations to the film students at Dearborn High. Uh, the students had received, had received seven film, uh, had seven films nominated and three that received student production awards from the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences. Um, the film Birdbath won for Best Fiction, Long Form. Winners included Victoria, uh, producer Victoria Irish, executive producers Iman uh, Alnakash, Jaden Burks, and Abbas Karnan, and actors Caleb Reese and Alexandro uh, Quezada. Uh, students also won Best Music Video for Nostalgia, which included uh, Victoria Irish as director, actor, songwriter, and Catherine Romain, Damian Minton, and um, Chloe uh, Rahal as actors. Iman Alakash as producer, and Abbas Karnad as director of photography. Uh, lastly, Victoria Irish, and I think we should remember that name uh, because uh, she's obviously sweeping a lot of awards here and has some really some deep talent. So she won for Best Talent Performer for Merrill's book, she played dual roles, talking to each other, and even did some puppeteering uh, in that short film. All of these student, DHS student films will be shown during their annual film fest 
on May 21st, and it will be outside at the fair. And finally, in the elementary school, commendations to Nadia Berry, who was recently named one of the five winners of the Dearborn Heights Women's Leadership and Community Service Award. Barry works as a liaison with our GSRP program and has served on the Crestwood School Board for four years. This time of year, the commendations start to stack up, so uh, we get more of those, but I think we all enjoy hearing them. So thank you. Thank you. Next item, please. Acknowledgement of donations. Here I am. Okay, donations. A donation of $20,000 has been offered to Dearborn Public Schools by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for makerspace STEM labs, uh, actually STEAM labs, in collaboration with Ford Fund. You know, we want to conclude the arts in STEM as well. So uh, a donation of $5,000 has been offered to Fortson High School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used in collaboration with TE Connectivity. A donation of $2,000 has been offered to Salina Intermediate School by the Mr. October Foundation for Kids to be used for the STEM after school program there. They need to add that. Uh, a donation of $10,065.86 has been offered to Whitmore Bowl School by Brian and Barbara Scott to be used to purchase 14 Dell laptop computers with backpack carrying cases to be used by Whitmore Bulls teachers in honor of their daughter and former teacher, Jacqueline Scott. A donation of 1,250 air filtration kits has been offered to Dearborn Public Schools by Ford Motor Company to be used in every instructional classroom in the district. A grant of $15,500 has been offered to Cotter Preschool to be used to purchase Let's Read It, a high scope program for all 32 GSRP classrooms and additional curriculum resources for small group instruction. And finally, a grant of $32,750 has been offered to Carter Preschool to be used for the three virtual training sessions for GSRP staff and a Keep Playing subscription for all sites. We want to thank all of those who donated to the Dearborn Public Schools for helping us. It is a partnership that helps our school district thrive and succeed in the way it does. And we thank everybody for those very, very kind donations. Thank you. Okay. Next item, please. Approval of minutes, approval of minutes of the following Dearborn Board of Education meetings. Build and Site Committee meeting April 8th, 2021. Policy Committee meeting April 12th, 2021. Executive session closed negotiations April 12th, 2021. Regular P to 12. Meeting April 12, 2021. City Relations Committee meeting. It was closed April 15th, 2021. Superintendent Evaluation Committee meeting, which was also closed April 28th, 2021. Recommended action, make any, any necessary corrections and move approval of these minutes. So moved. So support. We've got a motion by Trustee Patlichkoff, supported by Trustee McDonald. Any corrections that anyone wanted to draw our attention to? All right, then we'll do a roll call vote, please. Trustee Berry? Yes. Trustee D'Ambrasio? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Trustee Mosip? Yes. Trustee Petlishkoff? Yes. Trustee Watts? Yes. President Thorpe? Yes. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is special reports, assessment in Dearborn Public Schools, Dr. Dan Patterson. Well, good evening, President Thorpe, Dr. Maleko, and board trustees. I'm here tonight to talk about the assessments in Dearborn Public Schools, primarily the ones that we require our students to take. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to highlight how this aligns to our strategic plan like we typically do. Um, the subject of assessment primarily falls under focus area one, teaching and learning. But because surveys also fall under the assessment piece, we recently uh, did stakeholder surveys with our parents, students, teachers, and got critical information about district and school communication, parent involvement, employee satisfaction, 
um, and also our, our, we got some information on our school meals as well. Um, so those are some, um, that, some information that we will be sharing with you soon. I think we have all the reports ready to go with that. Uh, so what I'd like to do tonight is I'm going to begin by going over federal and state testing requirements. Uh, then I'll move into the locally required assessments that we offer here in Dearborn. And because one of those is NWEA, which is considered a benchmark assessment, I'd like to provide a little further detail on what type of assessment benchmarks are. So public schools primarily fall under the governance of our states, but there are some significant federal legislations that do um, influence um, some of the policies that we have to follow. So the, only about 10% of our funding comes from the federal government, um, but that funding that we get from the federal government is very critical to our program. Um, primarily that comes through title funds. Uh, title I is funding for our at-risk students. Um, title III funding is for our English learners. And there is legislation that ties that funding that we receive from the federal government to testing and accountability. Um, this legislation actually goes back to 1965 under the Johnson administration when Congress passed the Elementary and Secondary Schools Act. Um, and these funds were provided um, to help support at-risk students across the nation to help get some of the education that they needed based on their circumstances that might be above and beyond what schools could typically offer. Um, so this um, ESEA has been reauthorized almost every five years since 1965. The most famous version of this was the No Child Left Behind Act um, from 2002. And it was that act that actually um, tied annual testing in grades three through eight in high school, um, the public reporting of those test results along with school accountability to um, you know, the receipt of those Title I and Title III funds. So the current version of that law is the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, that was reauthorized uh, just about three or four years ago. It is significantly different than No Child Left Behind, but it still has the provisions of annual testing, school accountability, and um, several of those other pieces that were part of No Child Left Behind. It did provide schools some more, states some more flexibility, um, and also the accountability has changed, but we still are required to test based on those federal guidelines. Uh, so when this pandemic hit and we were, you know, hearing from a lot of different parties to stop doing testing, um, that's one of the reasons why we couldn't, as a local school district, make those decisions. It's also why our state could not necessarily make those decisions on their own. Our state actually had to um, submit waivers to the federal government um, asking for, uh, you know, those federal guidelines to be waived this year. Uh, we submitted several of those. Um, one of them was waived, so we were able to get the accountability portion of the um, ESSA bill waived. So we do not have to test 95% of our students. Schools are not going to be identified. Um, but the waiver that actually tried to eliminate testing, that did not get passed, which is why we are testing our students right now. Uh, the state did say that we should not bring in virtual students just for the sake of testing, um, but for our students that are coming to school, they, they expected testing to occur. To occur. Uh, so I have a couple of tables that can summarize some of the assessments, or actually hopefully all of the assessments that, that we require in, in Dearborn. So I apologize that this is a little small, but I was trying to get it all on a, a page to summarize it. Um, so starting at the top, um, I, I have listed the federal required assessments. Um, and I mentioned, uh, for our English learners, WIDA is the assessment that we give. Um, states have a choice in which assessments they choose. WIDA is an assessment given by a consortium of states. Um, I believe there is around 20 states across the, the nation that use the WIDA assessment. That's K through 12, and that's required of all of our English learners. Um, for our um, ESSA requirements in our grades 3 through 8 and 11th grade testing, we use MSTEP and then PSAT 8 in the 8th grade, and then the SAT in the 11th grade. The state also requires some further assessments on top of that. So in grades 9 and 10, we also administer the PSAT assessment. Those we are expected to 
um, offer our students. They are not actually tied to accountability, though. So we don't have to actually meet the 95% testing rate for those two grades. They're actually not publicly reported as well. Um, the state just offered those because we test in eighth grade and 11th grade, and they wanted to offer you know, that sequence of assessments so that students could get that feedback each year. There's also state legislature that requires the workies assessment um, as, a, as a career assessment in grades 11. And recently we've had a number of assessments added in our early elementary grades as well. So last year was actually supposed to be the first year that we offered the kindergarten readiness assessment, which is just a single assessment given in the fall to assess how well our kindergartners are ready for kindergarten coming in. We didn't give that because several components of that test require in-person instruction. Um, it's not all given individually to the kindergartner, but some of it is observing how they um, play and interact with other students. Um, so in the fall, we do anticipate giving that. And then a few years ago, as you all know, uh, the state um, initiated the reading by third legislation, and with that, some required assessments came along with it as well. Um, so in K through three, we're, we're required to what's called screen our students three times a year, which is to assess which students are could possibly be at risk of not reading in time. Uh, one of the assessments that was approved for that use was NWEA, and since we already had a history of using that in our district prior to reading by third, that's what we chose to use for that assessment. Uh, we also have a supplemental reading assessment that we're required to give. We chose to use the DRA. Um, and then finally at the bottom, we have a few dis uh, assessments that we do require in our district. Since we have a number of students coming in reading below grade level, we have some additional early reading assessments that we use to diagnose particular things along the path of reading and use for progress monitoring. And we've also been using NWEA um, K through H, um, reading and math and language three through H. Um, but as I mentioned, some of those are also required through the reading by third legislature. Um, and I do have a, an asterisk by there because this year the, the state actually mandated benchmark assessment testing in fall and winter as part of the extended continuation of learning plan, the e plan. And so within the first uh, I think it was eight weeks of school, we were required to assess all of our students in reading and math in K-8, and we're required to do that again the last eight weeks of school, which is why NWEA assessments are taking place right now. Uh, we did choose not to administer those um, in anything other than K-3 through three reading in the winter, just because we knew the impact on instructional time this year with everything going on. We just stuck to what was mandated by law. Um, in the past, we found that information useful, um, but this year we are trying to keep it, um, the, the impact as little as possible. And then just recently, over the last couple of years, the high schools have started administering some screening assessments in reading and math, and those are primarily to help identify which students might need some extra support, um, and that's part of best practices that have been recommended by uh, the state of Michigan and what we call our multi-tiered system of support program, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit um, later on. Uh, so just to take another view of these assessments, um, in this table I laid out kindergarten through 12th grade with our main assessment programs um, and listing the, the time needed to, to take each of those assessments. Because obviously we know instructional time is at a premium. Um, so for MSTEP and WIDA, again, those are federally mandated assessments through the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, those are the estimated times provided by the state of Michigan. Um, and then for NWEA, we give those assessments three times a year in fall, winter, and spring. And those times are for every single, like for the, all three administrations total for all subjects total. So that's the entire time for fall, winter, and spring combined. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we do have some reading by third assessments um, in the earlier grades. So if you take a look at the, the total for our required assessments, uh, I'm not saying that that's an insignificant amount by any means, but if you take a look compared to our percentage of instructional time, um, all of those grades are less than 2%, and most of them are less than 1%. Uh, there have been a few national studies on testing time because... I think you're all aware that, that this is something that's been in the news for many, many years, especially since No Child Left Behind. Um, and most of those have shown 
uh, the testing times to be at the at around two and a half percent in some of the the higher testing grades. And one of the things we've really tried to focus on is keeping it as low as possible. Um, so some of these assessments are obviously mandated outside of our control. Uh, the ones that we do mandate locally are ones that we felt provide us with, with valuable information. Uh, and just to go back to our, our focus on assessments, uh, a few years ago we did make an initiative to try to um, reduce the amount of assessment time as, as much as possible. And at that point, the only required assessment, this was back in 2017, was NWEA. Um, we've added a couple, like I just mentioned, since then, the reading by third assessments and the high school screeners. Um, but we also um, eliminated science testing at NWEA as well. We found that that wasn't very well aligned to our, our science program at the time. And in terms of the, the cost for our assessments, um, we have been using DRA as our reading assessment for years. So each year we supplement some of our kits. Those are not a, an extremely expensive item. NWEA is actually uh, something that the state has been funding through grant funds for almost every single year for the last five or six years. It was supported this year. Um, it's uh, supposed to be supported again next year. And the other assessments that we've been using have been developed internally just as part of our regular job and workflow. And then all federal and state testing is paid for by the state. And there's obviously going to be some, in, some small cost in terms of the time taking to like pack those things up, ship them, coordinate some of that. But in terms of the testing costs, it, it's, it's fairly minimal in the, you know, the, the, the budget of the, the district. So one thing I did want to just spend a little bit of time on, just because NWEA is one of our main locally um, required assessments, is just to explain what a benchmark assessment is and why we've chosen to use it. NWEA was brought into the district, I think, about six or seven years ago at this point, and it was actually brought in to eliminate a lot of the redundant testing that we were seeing across the, um, across the district. And it's also a critical part of what we call our multi-tiered system of support, our MTSS. Um, it's used as a screening test, and typically benchmarks are given two to three times a year. And the idea behind them is that there's typically this threshold that we call at risk, and we assess all of our students to see who might be in need of some extra support. And we use that information to align our resources and try to help um, support those students that might look like they're falling behind. And obviously, teachers always follow up with more localized assessments as well. And the use of benchmark assessments is actually pretty common across the state. Um, uh, NWEA told me that about 62% of the districts across the state of Michigan use them. Um, and these are some survey results just given in the last year by MBT. Uh, statewide, there's 836 districts. Um, and 515 use NWEA, 136 use other benchmarks, um, and then 185 just didn't answer the survey. And then more locally in Wayne County, out of the 33 districts, 19 use NWEA, seven other ones. So this use of benchmark assessments is, is a fairly common practice, not just in Michigan, but across the nation as well. Most school districts do have some system of MTSS where they screen students and provide extra support um, in uh, meetings and support them throughout the rest of the year. So one of the reasons that a lot of districts um, have moved to benchmarks um, is because many of them are computer adaptive. And, and MSTEP is also a computer adaptive assessment. And what might be kind of counterintuitive about these assessments is that regardless of where the student is, they're all designed to where the students will get about 50% of the questions right. Um, so it's not so much how many they get correct, but it's the level of questions that they're answering. Uh, so uh, what this is showing is that if we have a student that starts out with a grade level question and they get a few right, it will keep increasing the difficulty of those questions until they miss one. Mm -hmm. Then it will like lower the threshold a little bit. And then if they miss a few, it will keep lowering it until they get it correct. And then it will keep moving up and down in that level of rigor of the assessment 
until it kind of fine tunes where that student is. Um, so the reason that these have become very popular is because in a shorter amount of questions, we can typically get a fairly accurate idea of where students are, much better than we can with a paper, pencil, fixed form assessment. Uh, so this would be an example of a student that might test at a slightly higher level. I um, mean, it also gives us the ability to test above and below grade level. Um, one of the limitations of state assessments is that they have to be on grade level standards. So if you have a student that might be below grade level, it really doesn't say much about where that student is and where we can help them other than that test might have been too hard for them. Uh, so we use assessments um, for, for many things across the district and teachers use it as an integral part of just the teaching and, and learning cycle. Um, we, we couldn't have that cycle if it wasn't for assessment, um, but we have a lot of other uses for them as well. Um, and one of the reasons why we do want some common data across our district is because we do a lot of innovative things and we might bring in new programs um, or want to try out a, a new type of curriculum. And we use these assessment results to see if what we're doing is working. So we use it for program evaluation. We use it for district research. Uh, we also use it for public reporting. I know, uh, you know once or twice a year, I, I come and share our district's test results with all of you. Um, and it is also a uh, very important part to our strategic planning. Um, these, this is data that we, we use to help drive the, the vision of our, of our strategic plan over the last uh, few years. And also, our schools are required to um, report on their school improvement process. This has a new acronym um, over the last couple of years. It's called Michigan's Integrated Continuous Improvement Process. But schools are meant to gather many different types of data, um, look at where their needs are, and to adjust their planning to help meet the needs of all of their students. Um, and then lastly, like I mentioned, we also uh, try to survey our stakeholders, um, our parents, our students, uh, just to make sure that we're serving their needs and get the information we need. And as we move forward, I know our next presentation is on, on mental health. It's Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, many districts are starting to assess SEL, um, social emotional learning, more regularly. Uh, this is something we asked, did ask some questions on our most recent student and parent survey. Um, but those are some other things to, to consider as well as we move forward. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to make a couple comments about reading by third. Um, I think we can all agree that students reading in a timely manner is critical for their success. Um, and so many, if not all, of the assessments that we do give in K through three, um, regardless of the reading by third legislation, I think we would still choose to give just because it gives us valuable information on our, on our students and we, we try to use that, that information well. Uh, and we still want to continue to support our, our teachers and making sure that they have the information they need and understand how to use it um, to, to help our students uh, read in time. Uh, but we, we really do not support the retention provision of that law whatsoever. Um, we want to help our students, but we, we know that holding them back is, is rarely beneficial for those. And I, I, if I could just add, I appreciate uh, Dr. Patterson uh, mentioning that, uh, you know, Dr. Rice right now, too, has stated, um, you know, this is not a good timing to have to send letters to, to families of third graders um, during the pandemic. But unfortunately, there was no changes to the law, so it's going to be required. So we put out district-wide statements letting parents know there are those uh, exemption provisions within there that we would... Um, allow parents to explore their options and support them as much as possible. Um, but I've been in several meetings with Dr. Rice, and he's been pretty clear about that, but his hands are tied because he has to follow the law. Um, and just unfortunately, they weren't able to uh, move on this in the legislature, um, you know, during the, uh, the pandemic with a lot of things going on. And so we've been advocating for it, but it just wasn't able to get done. So we just, you know, we don't want parents to be, um, you know, um, to be upset if you see a letter coming from the state because we're not sending it. But contact your school. We'll help guide you through it. And uh, we know that we have different uh, exemption provisions um, that can be implemented. And I know Dr. Patterson does a great job making sure that the principals are aware of those uh, 
uh, provisions like for English language learners, special ed, and a whole other list of um, uh, provisions. In fact, the first initial part of the bill did not have those in there, and our associations, including, I believe, MASB, was involved in promoting to allow for some exemptions uh, because obviously each child is, uh, has unique um, needs, and we want to make sure we support the children when they're providing that education and not necessarily just you know, the retention of that. So some of the things in that law are good, though. It's supporting students' early childhood literacy, so I want to make that clear as well. That we do support a lot of in it, it's just the, the portion that Dr. Patterson mentioned. Yeah, and, and I did just want to make a quick comment that uh, that Dr. Chokel did submit uh, actually uh, a, a paper on our early literacy work to MD Top um, 10 and 10 um, to, to be highlighted at the state level, um, just based on the work that we're doing our reading K through five. Trustee Petlitchkoff. A um, couple things. One. I understand the need for some kind of uniform testing in a district. Every classroom is going to be a little different. Every teaching style is going to be incorporate different things. And we have to have a way to assess what we're doing across the district in total and, and have something to back that up. So I understand the need for some forms of assessment that are uniform. And you mentioned it, the commonality that are necessary because just relying upon just individual classroom teachers' um, assessment doesn't give us that kind of um, information. One of the things I've heard for many years is, um, and it's growing louder, is there's, there's a general discontent from parents and or teachers, teaching staff, about the test that they're asked to um, perform. And so um, parents are starting to um, ask to opt their children out of tests. Now you talked several times about 95% required. What are the consequences, especially with um, title money or any other kinds of consequences, if we start to see a larger um, number of students no longer being present to take the test so, that are required. No, no, thank you. That's a good question. With, with the, the change in the school accountability system, uh, I think you might all remember a few years back it was the report card system. Uh, now it's the index system. And there are, I think, seven metrics that our schools are evaluated on. And this is publicly reported um, on the state's website. Uh, there are test scores growth on test scores, English learner progress, graduation rates, a few other metrics. Uh, if a school does not meet the 95% testing rate, um, they take a fraction of how much you missed it by and modify your results based on that. So all of your other metrics are going to be lowered if you don't make the 95% testing rate. Um, just because then you're not really showing the full picture of your school. Um, so all of those metrics would be lowered, essentially making the school look like their performance is lower than it might actually be. Would it have other consequences other than our grade that we would be receiving? The, um, um, it it, it can otherwise? have some consequences with some of our smaller groups. So for example, uh, we have to have um, subgroups all have to meet the 95% participation rate. Most of our subgroups are large, but our special education population is very small. It would only take a handful of special education students to not meet that threshold. Um, and if we do have our school, any of our schools show up in the lower part of the school district spectrum um, based on these scores, which range from zero to 100, then we can um, have to, or we will be identified by the state to provide extra assurances to them that we're trying to resolve the, the issue. So yes, we can be identified. Trustee Rosa. So Trustee Peskov mentioned that parents, some parents and some teachers have very strong views as far as testing and, and were negative, con negative sentiments about testing. Can you tell us what are the negative aspects of, of 
assessments that students and parents are, are seeing or that you're getting feedback from? Uh, well, I think uh, some of the things we hear is, uh, I mean, one is that it takes up from instructional time. Um, in the spring, it definitely uh, does um, impact us a little more because we, we use N NWA internally because it's information that we can get back more readily to help make decisions with our district, but it aligns with, with state testing as well. So in the spring, it does seem like there's a lot of testing going on. Uh, there is some, uh, there is some concern about focusing on testing and test scores, about student anxiety, about taking tests, um, about uh, you know the consequences of low test scores as well, and and those are all things that we really do not want to have in our district whatsoever. Um, not to say that those things have have not happened. Uh, but we do want to, we definitely do not support those things at the district level. Um, and I do know that I've had conversations with um, many administrators, teachers, parents about some of those concerns. And we, we definitely do not want to, to support those. Um, I know one thing that we would definitely like to see moving forward is a better alignment between what the state wants us to test and our, our local assessment system. Um, we were hoping that the state would move to using some type of a local benchmark assessment in lieu of MSTEP, so we weren't like double testing in the spring just so we could get information that we need. Um, we're still hoping that that might happen you know, in the future. Trustee Watts. So a couple of things. Um, on the representation where it says other assessment uses, um, it doesn't have on here teacher evaluation. How did okay. the results of the MSTEP and NWA factor in for that? Okay, no, again, very good question. I actually probably should have included that as one of the other uses. Uh, so so a student growth on assessments is part of teacher evaluation. It's a part of administrator evaluation as well. Again, this is something that uh, we locally have not necessarily endorsed, but we do need to comply with the law. Uh, so. Right now, currently, uh, test scores are 40% of a teacher's evaluation. Um, as we were trying to design the teacher evaluation system, we really tried to design it in a way so that test scores would not negatively impact teachers. Um, so for example, the way that it works now, um, even though 40% is test scores, if a teacher is highly effective and rated at a four, if, they, if they're um, test scores are rated as effective. Those two things, the way that we would take the weighted average would be a 3.6 and we would round up to a four. Um, we always round up with all of our weighting system. Uh, the only way that a teacher would be lowered from a highly effective is if they were only, um, I'm trying to think of the term, but um, partially effective on their data. And honestly, the rubrics that we have been using it's not very easy to be to, to get that for a rating because we spread it across many different assessments. 20% uh, has to come from the state assessments, and I think I shared with all of you our state assessment table. Pretty much, and, and we use multiple years. So when you take a look at those multiple years um, across both subjects, pretty much every single school ends up being effective on the data. Uh, locally, we do use NWEA only at the building level. Teachers are not required to use it for their, for their personal data. And again, most of our schools do very well with student growth, so nobody has been penalized for, for low test scores, either with state data or for the local data. Um, and the biggest portion that, that teachers have in terms of their, their data is what we call their slow, their student learning objective. Um, that's 15% of their evaluation, and with that, they can actually choose the assessment that they want to give. Um, most teachers, it would be a pre and post test, and they can choose whatever it is that they're teaching that year that they'd like to focus on. So it could be writing, where they could give a writing assessment in the fall, um, see where their students are. If they have students that are below grade level, they could set a target that might be different from their advanced students, as long as they're all showing growth. Um, and again, we have a rubric for that that we feel is very realistic in terms of what teachers are able to do. So we do, we do know that it's very stressful for teachers, um, and we've had a lot of conversations with teachers because 
I mean, it is, it is part of what they're being evaluated on, but we really, really have tried to make it um, to where all of it um, gives them the most benefit of the doubt in terms of factoring into their evaluation. So then the other question I have is on regarding assessment times, um, does that factor in prep time or M-step practices? That the, that the teachers they're giving the students? The, these would be the, the um, just the times to take the test. Um, and in terms of the prep time and like practice time, I, I'm sure that there is some of that going on, but I would like to say that something at the district level that we do not try to endorse or try to say is a, is a good practice. The only type of test practice that uh, we ever try to encourage is just to make sure students know how to log on to the assessment, know how the buttons work, just so they're not confused on the first day. So, so for example, NWEA has a very short practice test where students log on and it's like five questions just so they can see how the interface works. Um, MSTEP also has a similar practice test where students can log on. It's three or four questions just so they can see the item types item types and know how the system works so they don't have that extra layer of anxiety on the first day of test. Outside of that, we really try our best to discourage solely test prep. Um, one of the messages that we, we um, that I'll try to reiterate is we don't want, we're not so worried if the test scores look good, we want them to be accurate so we can know what to, to do with the result. Um, and so that is really something that we want to encourage and, and if we, and if you're hearing a lot about test prep, um, those types of things, um, I'll be happy to try to re-address that with our, our staff again, because that really is something that we don't want to, to focus on whatsoever. So then the other question I have is, um, do we administer assessments that test our, our students' emotional IQ? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Do we um, test our students to determine their emotional, their social IQ, their problem solving? Do we have any of those assessments? I know that you were saying something was coming at SEL. Uh, currently, we do not. There are some programs like that that we have looked into with social emotional learning. Like I said, we offered some on our student survey and parent survey, but that was an optional survey. It is something that many districts are starting to do across the nation, um, but we have not um, gone down that road. Um, part of it is we just want to see how it fits in with everything else that we're doing. Um, but it is something that we have researched. We've looked at a few different um, options for that. And it is something we're still considering. Okay. And then um, we had spoken before, but we were talking about uh, students, the report cards versus their, their scores on their standardized tests. And with that, I can't remember, did you say that there was a correlation between the two? Or there was, I can't remember how that kind of, uh, this was something I actually took a look at uh, elementary through high school, and there's actually a fairly weak correlation between how students do in terms of report card grades versus how they do on, on test scores. And that's one of the things that we're hoping with our continued work with standards-based grading, trying to normalize our grading practices, getting our teachers together to work on common assessments and discussing assessment practices that we can have that be a little better aligned. Not to say that a standardized assessment like the SAT measures everything that we want to know in students, um, but we do want to take that into consideration that that can, you know, give us some indicator of how students might succeed in college. And we do want to make sure that our information aligns as best as we can. Uh, so when we do take a look at report card grades, um, we can find that um, a student might be uh, getting a B or an A in the class but not be able to be proficient on the state assessment. Um, and that's something that's pretty typical across the nation. The research that I've looked at it pretty much correlated with what I saw in our district. And I've done this kind of a study in previous districts I've worked at in similar results as well. So then I guess as a parent, am I focusing then on their report card or am I focusing on their... BRA levels and her MSTEP and her NWEA. Well, and this is where we, I think we definitely in our district try to embrace kind of a multiple measures approach. Uh, with, with test scores, 
we definitely do not want our students to be hyper focused on the test score results. Um, but we do want to make sure that our information correlates as best we can. And this is where teachers also have their professional judgment that, that weighs in as well. Um, so both of those things do matter to, to some degree, but we do need to, to weigh them out together. Um, we know that the emphasis on test scores and colleges' missions has been weakening over the last few years, so it's becoming less important what those test scores are in terms of college entrance, and it's much more on uh, grades and other things that the students are doing in school. Uh, but it is important to just make sure that the, what they're doing in class is at a high enough rigor and at the grade level standards that they should be um, working at. And if that's the case, then hopefully those two things should be fairly well aligned. So it, it's not necessarily a very simple answer. We, we try to take both of those things into, um, into, into accommodation. And where they're very off, that's where we need to have like a, a, a good look at the information to see why they might not be the same. OK, thank you. Trustee Rosa. Yeah, Dr. Patterson, do you think those standardized exams have implicit bias in them? I'm sorry. But Im implicit bias. Uh, uh, I do think, like, one of the things that I know that Dr. Maleko and I have talked about quite a bit is uh, with the M-STEP assessment, um, it's based on the Smarter Balanced Item Bank. And prior to coming to Michigan, I worked in California where we were administering Smarter Balance, so I was fairly, uh, you know, well-read on the development of that assessment in there. They did try to take aims to get rid of some of those biases. Um, but when MSTEP was developed, it was really done in a very quick way. Um, it's been changed several times over the last several years. And we've been asking for validation and reliability studies, and we have not seen any of those yet. Um, so I really can't say confidently, because I've never seen the data, how well, you know, the, how little bias there are in those assessments. That's, that's definitely been a criticism of standardized assessments across the um, you know, history of standardized testing. And with the newer designs of these next generation, next generation assessments, they have really tried to minimize that. Um, but like I said, with our state assessment system, I really haven't seen a lot of the data that would, would show that type of 